First, it's time for The Moral Maze. Here's Michael Burke. Good evening. Nine months to go to the turn of the millennium, and what might have been a preoccupation with the past has actually become an obsession about the future. So much has changed in a century, a generation, a decade. We seem to be rocketing away from our history into a future of almost limitless technological possibilities and cannot decide whether they'll make mankind better or worse. These are questions that are littered with paradox. Information technology that offers total communication to isolated individuals. Supersonic transport that destroys distance but delivers you to the edge of a city so crowded that the average speed of its traffic has fallen below that of the horse-drawn hansom. Scientific advances, they said, would usher in the age of every man, but seem to be opening up an ever-deepening division between those who have access to them and those who do not. Medical developments, particularly in the field of genetics, that are the most problematical of all, that seem to suggest we can predict a person's predisposition not just to disease, but to behavioural characteristics, criminality, alcoholism, homosexuality, depression, perhaps that seem to hold out the chance of altering our own evolution, creating life, playing God. When we think all things are explicable and can be altered, what does that do to the ethical framework of our lives, our sense of what it means to be human? Morality and the technological future. In Science Week, our moral maze, live with our regular panel, Janet Daly of The Telegraph, Professor Ian Hargreaves, the journalist and academic, the constitutional historian, Dr David Starkey, and Dr David Cook, the medical ethicist from Oxford. Ian. Well, taken together, I think that these advances in communications technology and biotechnology probably are the biggest science-driven changes to our way of life, perhaps in human history. They affect absolutely everything. Birth, death, the way we learn, work, talk, trade, have fun, even the way we think. And they present us with a blizzard of complex choices. Given the speed of the changes, the strain placed upon our moral framework is palpable. But personally, I remain to be convinced that it undermines the basis up upon which that framework is constructed. Janet Daly. Well, uh, before we get too apocalyptic, I think we have to distinguish between technological innovations that are really all about speed, the speed of telecommunications or the dissemination of information or even physical travel, and those that call into question what it means to be human. Being able to communicate instantly with the rest of the world via the internet may be interesting, but it isn't startlingly unlike using radio and television or even the telephone. But uh, genetic ma manipulation, on the other hand, is different in kind from previous forms of medical intervention. It's quite misleading to say that altering genetic material is no more unnatural or philosophically disturbing than administering antibiotics. Not all technological advance presents the same sort of moral dilemma, and we shouldn't put them all in the same package. David Starkey. I think it can really be put quite simply, Michael. You began with the contrast between technology and value systems. Technology has delivered plenty. All our previous value systems, and indeed the ones we have at the moment, are essentially based on shortage and scarcity. We're on the threshold of a new world, a brave new world, in which most of the past is redundant. David Cook. My granny-in-law lived to be 100. She remembers the first car, the first radio, the first television, the first spaceman. But what was interesting was that she retained the fundamental values of family, about respect for others, about kindness and about love. See, it's not technology that frightens me, it's the philosophy behind it, the reductionism, the materialism, the determinism. When it comes to technology, there is no technological imperative. Just because we can do something, we still have to ask, ought we to do it? And that's a question about humanity, it's about choice, it's about limits, it's about fundamental values. Panel, thanks very much indeed. Our first witness is John Browning, who was uh, formerly editor of uh, magazine Wired UK, um, arch commissar of the information revolution. You think it's all neat and groovy, don't, uh, don't you, John? Uh, but you don't think it's perhaps helping to make us more arrogant, divided? lonely, less human. Well, I mean, let's look at the internet in particular, and you know, to argue that the internet is making us more divided when it's the greatest communication and the fastest growing communication medium we've seen is is kind of hard to do. It's all about people talking to other people. Yeah, but they're talking to. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I mean, I, I was in the Yahoo chat room the other day. Uh, Help you, uh, Michael. Well, ex exactly. <laughs> and the, you you pull down, uh, you know, on one side your emotions smile, happy, these sort of things. It seemed, it seemed ineffably sad to me. Well, I mean, 15-year-old boys hang out in the Yahoo chat room, and I hope you met some nice ones. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but simply because the Yahoo chat room lets you choose your emotions from a menu doesn't mean that you can't express yourself. That might not be your way of doing it, but for a 15-year-old boy as opposed, to, as opposed to hanging around in the playground and tossing around insults, maybe it's an improvement. For the most part, though, I don't think the technology, you know, in any way... In, you know, stops you from expressing yourself as you see fit, where you see fit, to more people than you uh, you could before. So you're wholly optimistic. You have no reservations about the technological revolution on any of its planes. Oh, I think I always have reservations about specific technologies. Um, you know, technologies can be used well and used badly. There are technologies that personally I like and personally I dislike. I like the internet. I don't like television. Do I think that by and large the world is getting better? Yes. David Starkey, a witness. Let's just ignore the question of whether it's getting better. We obviously accept that it's getting very different. Okay? Very, very different. Yes. But most of what we regard as our moral values, this great Judeo-Christian tradition, were formulated in a world of 2,000 years ago. Now, can those values, let me just list one or two of them, uh, chastity, self-denial, self-restraint, ability to tolerate pain, do you see them surviving into your brave new world? Well, I'd step back a sec and say, you know, your Judeo tradition, my Judeo Christian tradition, but it's not the world's Judeo Christian tradition. We're living in a very multicultural society that's coming from a bunch of different places. Well, do I see also, do I see yeah. traditional moralities yeah. of all stripes still surviving? Yes, because the point of the technologies and you know is that they give us choices. The way we make choices, mm -hmm. or one of the ways in which we make choices, is using morality ethics, our notions of what's right and wrong. So do it you makes think them this... more important rather than less. So you are then one of those people like the Daily Telegraph that used to say times change. I've never but been values, compared to a newspaper. But, 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 well, uh, Janet's sitting here, but values remain the same. So you think it's entirely coincidental, for example, do you, that nowadays uh, we have, uh, what is it, uh, half our babies are born outside wedlock. Don't you think that perhaps this new technological world might have something to do with that? Do computers make us have sex outside of wedlock? I, I, I'm having trouble here making this jump between machines and people in bed. Well, you've heard of contraception, presumably. Yes. Maybe you use it. Do you think that might have something to do? With having babies. Con contraception is about not having Indeed, babies. Last time I read the instructions fact, on the packet. Ab absolutely. But don't you think <clears throat> it's altered how we view relationships? Do I think it's... Um, in the sense that, again, we have more choices about relationships, yes. It has altered like that. Like it being perfectly all right now, to have gay relationships, like it being perfectly all right to have children outside marriage uh, if we don't use the contraception, because this wonderful world enables us to pay for it. To jump from saying we have a choice to saying it's perfectly all right is a big one. And one of the interesting things that happens with this technology gives us these choices is effectively, you know, we have a, a plebiscite on that. Uh, people make their own choices and they decide. Everyone gets that opportunity. Uh, and indeed, but the only problem is, isn't it, that the choices all seem to be going in one direction. We seem to have decided that this old morality doesn't work in the new world. I think that has absolutely nothing to do with technology and a lot to do with how people react to change. Janet Denny? Which is you, technological. Uh, hang on a second, David. Mm. Janet Denny. You seem to be implying that human communication is entirely about information, the exchange of information. Is that, am I right in understanding you to say that? Yes. I mean, you that's really a fair think that's definition. that's all there is to human communication? Emotion is a form of, you know, information in a broad sense includes emotion. Emotion is a form of information. Now that's... Mm. Uh, so, so you don't think that the a-socializing, you know, the removal from of a, from a social context of the conveying of information, which is what Michael Burke was implying was wrong with communications through technology, you don't see any problem. You're about trying that. to tell me that the Yahoo chat room is not a social context. Uh, not a social context. No, not a it's full not, it's human not one, social context. Oh, please, no. it is a human social context. No, no, it's people a chatting full through a computer human social in a, context. In a way that a cocktail party or anything else is a partial context. Well, I yes. mean, hey, I, mean, I you, know, used, you choose your yeah. context. You make your well, choices. Well, let me. I mean, I use and the internet. The I use the internet, and I find it extraordinarily slow, mostly pretty boring. 
thoroughly indiscriminate because for the very reason that a lot of people like it because it has no editing facility um, it's a pretty tedious way of communicating with people if that was my only way of communicating with people I think I'd be suicidally depressed for it's not your only way of communicating with people no exactly it's not a full human transaction that's exactly the point but that I'm making. nor is you know n to say that the only way of communicating is to sit around in a room and that's the only true communication no, no, no. is, is no. equally biased it's not a substitute for media, the full human media communication have always that's what been I'm suggesting rather than ors we add to the you know to the greater to the number of choices we have i think you've made, your point, you made your point janet i think you've made your point janet i mean that's Ian kind of pathetic, uh, really. john <coughs> uh, one with you uh, on the yahoo chat room and the internet but i wonder whether there might be a problem uh, that you're not addressing and that is the coming together of the information technology revolution with the biotechnology revolution which allows globalization at huge speed of money, of information, of meaning. Doesn't that create a speed, a dynamic, and a danger that we simply will be doing things at a rate that we cannot properly morally understand? I want to step back and, and, and take this point that was really made about change being technologically driven and that somehow we're being cast like leaves before the wind into this future that we, we can't cope with and don't understand. It's not. We're making these choices. We're buying these technologies. We're adopting these things but and putting them to use for to us. For example, we're all don't making they? these choices. Yes, but, but it, the choices may appear to be made by consumers, but consumers make choices that are framed by corporations to a, to a significant extent. But you look out in the marketplace, most technologies that are introduced fail. Well, the only people that can make choices not frame, you know, not that don't have to go to the market and let consumers choose that way are governments. But we are not, we're not the only the technology that was ever forced upon the world was done by Stalin and that was some of his Mendelian Well, we, we, we seem to be being obliged in Europe to, uh, to swallow the technology of genetic food at the present time, for example. I hardly see anybody being obliged to do anything. I mean, you know, it will they go on the shelves, people will there. buy it or not buy it. That's not the position. David Cook. It's, I just wonder whether humanity can live by electric wiring alone, but my concern really Clearly is the elitism. Clearly it can't, but that's, but that's... What's the more then? Sorry? What's the more then? Well, I mean, people, because we have electric wiring, because we have computers, doesn't mean we stop having sex. It doesn't mean we stop going to cocktail parties. It doesn't mean we stop writing letters. You know, television didn't get rid of the movies. Movies didn't get rid of, rid of the theater. The theater didn't get rid of sitting around a campfire and telling stories it to can each other. It does affect the culture, but part of my concern here is an elitism. An elitism which says if you have the money to have the internet, if you have the skill to have the internet, well, that's fine. You're plugged into this world. The, the most pernicious the world elitism around this. here is the people saying, oh, no, no, nobody can have it because everybody can have it have it. The self-appointed guardians of, you know, the universal public good are the most elite people around here. And, you know, heaven save the public from their own guardians. John Browning, thanks very much indeed. Our next witness is Brian Appleyard, the uh, uh, commentator on moral and other issues and the author of Brave New Worlds, Genetics and the Human Experience. Um, Brian, what is it that you distrust about the pace of technological change? Do you feel that we're somehow being pushed out of our moral universe? Well, I think the, the, the great illusion is that um, technology is in itself a value system. Um, and I think precisely what we're talking about, the movement towards a, a, a highly technologically determined period, uh, raises the question of where would your values come from in such a world? Um, and I think you know, we've spoken about Judeo-Christian values that are 2,000 years old, but they are not 2,000 years old. They're not frozen 2,000 years ago. They have developed since in, in various ways. And I think the problem now is that the elevation of technology to a value system, which I think is what is occurring now in various ways, um, is going to threaten us to me all sorts of uh, possibilities of disorder and um, transformation of human uh, life. Ian Hargreaves, your witness. Uh, Brian, I'd like to focus on one subject that you've written uh, powerfully uh, about, which is the subject of your niece who died after um, having suffered from muscular dystrophy, uh, a condition which can be genetically, uh, something can be done about it, uh, possibly, in the future, uh, uh, but which you um, suggest, uh, rightly, uh, is often dealt with by abortion. What is your moral position about that? 
I, I find it very difficult to answer that question simply. Um, the point I was trying to make was that in considering her life, considering her character, um, I considered what it meant to be human and what precisely the values were involved here. Now, obviously, this is a very difficult issue because you can't say it is good that she had muscular dystrophy. On the other hand, there were very positive things I derived from it and other people who knew her did. And that is an area I'm just simply meditating upon. I don't pretend to have the answers. But have, have you reached the conclusion, that, because you appear to have in the way that you write about this, have you reached the conclusion that it is wrong for parents who are informed that, they, uh, that their child in the womb uh, has got um, a genetically caused um, condition, should, that they're wrong to go for abortion? I am against abortion myself. I do not pretend to know and to speak for everybody else in this area, and it's an immensely sensitive area, uh, which I understand very deeply, um, the sensitivities involved. Um, I think that um, there is a problem that genetics seems to be ex inflating, exaggerating, which is to do with the commodification of human life, the turning of human life into um, uh, something that can easily be manipulated, changed or uh, deleted. And that is what I'm most concerned with. But, but have you come to your position on abortion through reasoning about this new genetic technology, or did you hold that view anyway? Or have you discovered no, no, it inside uh, yourself? I, I would say it was prior to that. Yes. So, in fact, it's not the technology in this example which has caused your moral concern. The moral concern remains, you know, the absolutely proper moral concern about where human life begins and what rights we have to interfere with that. Yes, but I think the technology is persuasive in a particular way. It puts people, it creates hard cases and then sort of uh, creates the, inter the um, decision for people in extremely hard cases. So uh, David Stockley. Brian, you said that science and technology shouldn't set values, although they appear to be doing so. So what is the source of these values? Art? Um, <laughs> Again, I don't pretend to be able to answer that simply. I think the point is that um, we, are, we all must be aware of the fact that values must exist for, for all sorts of reasons, the most banal levels of order in society and for, for any level of higher um, uh, level of human experience you care to name. I think there is a problem about where we get our values. I think the idea that they can be derived from technology is simply incoherent. I don't but, see I mean, how they can you be. You have actually said that they should come from art, but isn't the problem that the arts themselves have been transformed by technology? The 20th I'm century has seen the death of... I'm not aware of having said they should come from art. No. Uh, no you said you, that, actually. You, you, cer you, 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 you certainly have in print. Uh, mm. The arts... Uh, no, no, I say, I say that the arts are an embodiment of, of values which I do regard as extremely important, if not absolute. Are they the embodiment? But isn't the problem the arts themselves have shuttered down in front of technology, figurative, the whole tradition of, religio of, yes, Renaissance, I... of, of Renaissance painting has collapsed? Uh, you are defining the, problem, the very problem I am defining, which is that there is a conflict between, between technological innovation and, and the value systems which have sustained us thus far. Um, I, I want to find a way of resolving that conflict. I don't, I'm not against the pace of technological change. I'm against the claims being made for technology these days by certain It writers. seems a very jealous God, doesn't it? What? Technology. Much more jealous than Jehovah. Uh, it is an extremely jealous God, and that precisely is the point. And that sounds like David Cook's cue. Well, if we could leave the theologian David Starkey to ask a question, I think, which is a common denying. theme. Um, technology, in one sense, particularly in genetics, has a particular view of what is normal. Uh, and in one sense, when you're arguing we mustn't lose these human values, there's a view of what is normally human. Can you help us understand a little bit more what that normality is? Well, I think, I think genetics is, a, is high, potentially highly normative science. It tend, it, 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 if, when people have babies, they want them above all to be normal. This is in conflict with the way we value adults. We value adults for their differences, for their oddities, eccentricities, whatever. So it's whatever. prescriptive, not just descriptive, then? Yes, and I think, I think the, there's a serious problem here. If, for example, you found a, a gene for homosexuality, which, in spite of publicity, they haven't found yet, or would parents decide to abort homosexual fetuses? And, you know, 
most geneticists say yes, they probably would. The most the ones I've spoken to, and that would be seems to me to be absolutely catastrophic. But and, does that and, tell and us ex- something extremely. about human nature as well? Then yes, indeed, and it also tells us that eugenics of a particularly savage form could be introduced by free markets. Janet Denny. You talk about um, the determinism that's implicit in in technology, um, but you could say that in a previous just play devil's advocate, I suppose in a previous century you could say that that agriculture had a kind of determinism, the agricultural year and the forces of nature, and we now, with, perhaps with nostalgia, tend to regard that as more natural. But is that because we're not in control of it, because it was out of our control? Yes, I think. I mean, obviously, the two things are quite different. Um, a, a, a rhythm we control, a technological rhythm we control, is, is is something we're making decisions about. Is something, although we may feel powerless in the powerless in front of the scale of technology, we have some intuition that it is a human force that we are somehow doing it, and that the idea of being part of something larger is obviously has different moral implications to the idea that we're part of something humanly created. So we like we prefer to be absolved from the moral, the ultimate moral responsibility. I mean, we feel happy when we can attribute it to nature or um, the seasons. I'm not sure that's or... quite the way I'd put it because I think that the idea of ultimate res- or moral responsibility is an external, like the forces of nature, put in that way. Yeah. So that, that um, uh, the idea that you'll be absolved by the forces of nature is not quite how I'd say it. But, yes. Brian Appleyard, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Our next witness is Lord Winston, who's, uh, of course, head of the fertility clinic at, uh, at Hammersmith Hospital. Um, uh, you think I know, because I must have read it somewhere or heard you say it, that uh, that you think um, uh, life's better uh, in 1999 than it was in 1899 or 1499. Do you think life will be better still in 2099? I think there's a fair chance it might be. I, I mean, I, I find myself... I mean, I feel this is very boring, but I find myself very much in agreement with so much of what Brian Appleyard has said, actually. The only difference is that I think he's a good deal more pessimistic than I am. I, I'm, I'm fundamentally optimistic. I believe that what we have shown is that we can control technology and I think that I agree that the pace is different but I think that is still something that we can deal with too. You're not presumably in agreement with him when he said, uh, made a note of it, that he that he, he for, saw a situation or was afraid of a situation where eugenics might take a particularly savage form. No, I, 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 th- I think he's wrong about that. I mean, and also I, I don't think people um, actually want to have a normal baby. I don't think it's that simple. I think what people want to have is not a disabled baby, preferably. But having had a disabled baby, it doesn't mean to say that that life shouldn't be fully valued and doesn't actually have great value uh, intrinsically. Um, and, I, I, and I think that's really where we start to part company. David Cook, you I'm interested in this notion of intrinsic value because uh, if you're an optimist about technology, surely you recognise that technology has also raised many moral questions. To some extent, new kinds of questions like what is a parent or questions about cloning, for example. Where are we going to find the resources to answer these? I think that's one of the biggest problems. I mean, I think that one of the issues invariably but it's not a new issue, is that technology does produce uh, inconsistencies and unevennesses in society. And clearly, we're going to see this more and more, uh, even if we have a very uh, wealthy society, for example, in the West, we're going to have uh, a very uh, repressed and suppressed and poor society elsewhere. And I think that that is a real issue. But I don't know um, that technology per se is necessarily responsible entirely for that. It's something which comes, I think, as some people have access and can buy the technology and others can't. Right, but we'll have to have some moral base from which to respond to these kinds of questions. And is that going to be an individual? Is it going to be a historical? Is it going to be some kind of universal morality? Where are we going to get our morality from? Well, we've never had a universal morality. Um, But we have had a kind of morality which has been knowledge-based. Um, I, I'm reminded uh, of uh, some writings of a very obscure person, Elijah bin Meyer, who wrote in the 1700s about the sperm, saying that he could see that it was obviously quite wrong. That the, rab- the old rabbis were right in saying the masturbation was wrong because it was destroying seed. It was like murder because they'd seen down the microscope a little homunculus in the sperm head. He was using, of course, false scientific information. But you don't believe that? And, no, of course I don't and, believe that. And because what do you believe in its place then? Well, I, I mean, I think what I believe in, actually, are, are, are religious or ethical values, or mor- moral values, if you will, which are, which are based on, on scientific knowledge, which are based on knowledge of our universe, which are based on knowledge of things around us. But are they purely instrumental values, then, or intrinsic values? Because I'm not quite sure where No, the I think they're intrinsic. Uh, I mean, I think... 
I mean, I, I mean, I, I have to say, uh, and I'm out of, on a limb, uh, but I think actually our morality is largely religious based. I wouldn't dissent from yeah, that. Of course, with. you wouldn't, Ian Hargreaves. You, you made uh, you made one man happy. <laughs> um, you said you largely agreed with Brian Appleyard, but you uh, also said that you thought that by and large we can control technology. One of the things that Brian Appleyard speaks about is market eugenics, mm. the forces of business which are very powerful in a world which has embraced open market capitalism, um, affecting genetics, affecting, to take an older technology, environmental, the environment caused by, you know, the way we burn fuels and so on. I mean, isn't it possible that your moral sense, my moral sense, what we want morally, will be overwhelmed by those forces? I, I think it's a possibility, but I, I also think that we may be at risk of being a bit too determinist in our analysis of what genetics can do. You see, I'm, I'm, I, I think we still have a very simplistic view about the genome. I think we have a very simplistic view about the translation of the knowledge from the genome into those proteins. The fact is, my genes make proteins inside my body, which overall are unique to me as a person. But they don't explain how I look, or really how I behave, or how I think. But, but take the example outside of your own field of the environment. Isn't it at least logically possible that we have allowed market forces to drive us into such an environmental imbalance that there will be a catastrophe of global warming. Yes, of course. I, I mean, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a real risk, and that's why I suppose uh, people like myself tend to argue for uh, some kind of control on technology. Um, now, whether that is attainable, I, I think, is an open question. Um, I, I like to believe that it is. Starting. Lord Winston, you said that you thought the essential source of values was religion. How compatible is your sort of genetics with Genesis? I mean, the first book of the Bible. Well, I mean, I, I, I had a feeling you might take issue with me on that, but I, I, I don't really think um, that the that Genesis. Uh, per se, need to be taken quite at, at face value. What I think, but just as a myth, as well, the right, idea of God if you're, the Creator. Well, I think what Genesis could tell us is that we are given um, tools of creation, which we can use for human good and for the protection of life. That's a kind of universal message. So that in the fact, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Haven't we decided that we're terribly fond of the fruits of it? Yes, I think we probably are. Uh, a man is in a very inquisitive animal. And where is the angel with the sword? I don't worry too much about mythology. I mean, I have to say that I'm more interested, I think, in the philosophy than the mythology of behind, behind the chapter. Then can I just ask a final question? Why do you think in this wonderful good age, as you said, this age of prosperity and security of life, churches are empty and synagogues are emptying even faster? Well, I'm not sure that they are. Mm. They are, uh, visibly. Well, 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 not in the world well, as a whole. Um, no. actually, uh, but in our world, this prosperous Western world. As you said, the other world's different. David, I'm not sure that you're entirely right. I mean, I think that uh, the... Uh, the statistics, uh, you said it, science and statistics, it, you know, statistics on my uh, side. Thank, perhaps thank I you, should David. just answer the question, yeah. if I may. Yeah. I, I mean... On the, the basis of fact. There are, well, there, David. Are, there are signs that, for example, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for other religions, but I, I happen to be a Jew. If you look at uh, Jewish philosophical thinking, there's a great burgeoning of, of, of literature, a great burgeoning of actual seminars but on these very issues. Now, David, I think, you, I think you may have... I, I think bums on seats in places as well. But <laughs> Not in the West. Can you, How eloquent. Janet Daly. Can I ask you about intrinsic? You said that you thought moral values were intrinsic, and let's just leave aside the question of formal religion for the moment. They must be intrinsic, presumably, you'd say, to what we regard as being human. To the, to, hmm. right to the human condition and I think what's being suggested is that the technology could actually put at risk what we regard as being human I think that's quite true and indeed uh, one has to admit that if you define a species as its genome and you then alter that genome radically you've changed that species and you could argue that in the fullness of time we might do that to the human species, that's a possibility however, perhaps the protection is that the manipulation of the genome has been shown again and again so far with given knowledge at the present time to be terribly inconsistent and very, very unpredictable. So, mm -hmm. in fact, if you change... So we're just, not really in control. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. so if you take, change one gene, mm -hmm. you, you do something which is so essentially dangerous mm. that, you know, you, that may actually be the best safeguard of all. But it's logically possible to intervene in the very idea of the creation of human beings. 
Yes, it is. Uh, and, of course, it then comes down to whether you're doing something which is... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, of course it would be possible to, to interfere with the creation of a, a human being. You could um, artificially produce a, a chemical, a piece of DNA, which is art artificially made in the laboratory, and alter the structure of the genome. The reason why I don't think we're going to do that as soon as people say we're going to do it is because I think, essentially, uh, the, the, the repercussions for the people who do it would be so enormous. And I think that there is actually a great sense of responsibility, a much greater sense of responsibility than people realise amongst the scientists who actually have this sort of work. Well, Winston, thanks very much indeed. Our last witness is uh, Andrew Brown, author, uh, among other things, of uh, a book called The Darwin Wars, which is about genetics. Uh, uh, Andrew, if we, if, if we do get to the stage where we can manipulate our own evolution, even create life, be it only a, be it only a bacterium, uh, are we not playing God, and where does that leave our humanity? Well, I think we, there, was a, there was a catchphrase that I rather liked, that, yes, we are playing God, but we might as well get good at it. We can't. <laughs> um, yes, we may find ourselves doing things which were traditionally reserved for God, but in that case, we will try to live, just have to try to live up to these responsibilities. We can't go back. Um, what would count as living up to the responsibilities? What would count as being good or bad without some intrinsic sense of value? Well, I think in some cases not doing it would count as living up to the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of things of which God is capable, which we'd rather he didn't. Well, exactly. But then aren't you, aren't you just undoing what you said a moment, moment ago? You said if we, if we can play God, we may as well get good at it. Now you're suggesting that the best thing we could do, perhaps morally, is not to do it at all. I th I think that the difference is that, in my suggestion, we, in, in my version, we would draw back from it because it was our decision without saying, um, without appealing to some kind of um, sanction outside us, because I don't think that um, that kind of appeal would actually work very much anymore. We could w appeal to a sanction inside us. It is surely possible to say this would violate our deepest instincts and for this to mean something. The instincts have a moral force? Yes. I mean, but there must be a connection between our instincts and our morality. Um, ah, yes, but what do the instincts connect to? I mean, are, the, are the instincts... What, what, I mean, are you saying that if, if we have some sort of as it were, almost physiological instinct to, with, to, to, re, to restrain ourselves, not to do, you know, to, to force ourselves not to do something, that somehow that in itself is a moral foundation? I think we have complicated and contradictory instincts, and these are our moral foundation, yes. But do you think, uh, sorry to interrupt Janet's uh, okay. uh, thrust, that, that, that history shows us that human beings have an instinct for restraint in the way that you suggest? They... They can learn restraint as a means of balancing their instincts and have indeed done so. In a consumer society in which everything is available, do you think restraint, look around now, do you think it's a, a welcome value, one that's praised, substantial? It's more honoured here and in Europe generally than it is in America and I would imagine that the the really nasty bits of genetic engineering and people designer babies and that kind of stuff would actually go on in the Far East, where there is a, you know, the, the idea... Can that we just shift away from the genetics question? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think, generally, you were talking about instincts, mm. do you think, generally, in this consumer society, that restraint is significantly valued at all? We, after all, you know, consume, therefore we are, don't we? No, I, no, I don't think it's valued. I, no, I don't think it's very highly valued publicly. I mean, everything possible is done to loosen people's restraint. You go round a so shopping mall. So then, room. where is this wonderful restraint that's going to stop us doing the worst aspects of playing at being God? Where's it going to come from? Well, partly it's going to come from self-interest and partly the people who make the sort of genetic choices that we were talking about. Who's self-interest? The company's self-interest? Biotechnical company's self-interest? Monsanto's self-interest? Who's self-interest? Well, I was going to say enlightened self-interest, but I, 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 t I mean, I think you're leading me in a pessimistic direction which I can't resist. You can't uh, resist? Why can't you resist it? 
because human nature is necessarily yeah. evil. I wonder David if you can just clarify for me whether your morality now is a question of instinct or whether it's a question of culture. Because when you talked about instinct, I thought you were talking about general human instincts and drives. But then you drew a distinction between the Western world and the Eastern world, the Far East, as if it was a cultural norm. Which is your morality now? Well, I think that any, any occurrence of instinct you find is going to be bound up in a particular culture, and different cu cultures will satisfy different balances of, 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 of instincts, and too. And are there no values extent. which transcend culture, then? Values yes, about truth, about beauty. I think there probably are, but that's not to say that they're universally recognized. Right, but ought they to be universally recognized? I mean, is there some kind of moral imperative, some kind of framework that we need in order to control and to address the technological issues? There are probably several frameworks which would allow us to control and address them, but... Um, because... It, and would some of those frameworks be better than others, then? Yes. And, and how do you make the criterion? Well, I think, for example, that parents do not or should not, do not have and should not be treated as if they have the right to fiddle around with technologies that may or may not produce babies, but will, uh, that are superior so or more desirable. So we limit fertility choices? Yes, I would. But on what moral basis Jenna can Jenna? you say that? What's the judgment? You know, what, on what grounds are you making that judgment? I can understand if you say we're a Roman Catholic and said that, but I take it you're not. So what is, your, what is the foundation for your moral judgment about that? Uh, a principle that you um, don't really have the right to do anything you like to your children, even if you think it's good for them. The same kind of principle that leads me to say that foot binding is a bad idea. Well, then you've got presumably um, maybe a utilitarian ethic or maybe an ethic based on compassion. And in a sense, you're, what you're alluding to is, is a kind of universal moral value. In most societies that have survived long enough to be recorded, people do regard mercy and compassion as admirable traits and as virtues. Mm. So maybe that's a, that's a starting point, isn't it? I mean, that's a sort of... But equally, we talk about mercy killing, don't we? Oh, yeah. In this society that simply yes. regards life as a commodity. But it's necessary... Well, hang on a second. Could we let Andrew, yeah. we let Andrew yeah. answer yeah. one of these things? David, David Stock, well, a moment. Well, no, a, 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 David Stock, a moment, please. Hang on, what I was going to say to Janet is, yes, we do regard these as, as values and which we, we, which we esteem, but... Um, plenty of societies have found it remarkably easy to overcome this oh, esteem. Sure. That's why I used foot binding as an example. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, David. Uh, no, you I was make putting to you, I mean, Janet, on, on the subject of mercy. Mm. Mercy, as we know, can be interpreted in several different ways. I referred to mercy killing. The idea of euthanasia, if you regard life as a good life, i.e. one in which you're an effective consumer and can enjoy things as much as possible, which seems to be the value most people hold, doesn't it? Mm. Well, no, it isn't, because the, the reality <laughs> is that society, and particularly British society, is saying, no, we won't have legislation in favour of euthanasia because we don't think that this is a proper view of mercy. We don't think that killing people is a good pattern for our society. Do you agree with that? Well, actually, I'm extremely much in favour of euthanasia in some cases. So you, um, you believe in justified killing, then? Yes. You wouldn't I've, give people or, fertility choices, but you will justify killing of older people. Can, Andrew, can you... Uh, uh, no, hang on a second, John. No, no, pipe okay. down and let if Andrew if I, if I flesh, give, flesh if this out. If I can out. give um, a, a, a simple personal um, example. Um, my father um, died of a heart attack and was more or less brought back from the dead and then kept alive in a vegetative state for about a fortnight until a doctor could be found who was willing with the full knowledge of the family and we knew what he was doing even if he couldn't say it to give him increasing doses of heroin until he died and this was dressed up in various ways but we knew what was happening and it was absolutely the right thing to do now perhaps this was an artificial situation because he had after all been brought back the inappropriateness of this Andrew Brown thanks very much indeed um, uh, where does that leave us? Uh, David Starkey, when you, when you were talking to Andrew, you seemed to be perilously close to saying that uh, our morality was in some wise uh, dependent upon lack of choice. I think that's absolutely true. I think that certainly the whole Judeo-Christian tradition was based on the idea that morality was literally given from...
from outside man, which is is what the the, the, the no. Let me please let me. Uh, mm, the, or the, or the, uh, uh, this isn't television. All this head shaking doesn't really come over very well. But there is there are we'll commands. Find the boys, David. There are commandments handed down, and that the very finiteness of human experience, the fact that life is a datum that is given to us, um, the fact that death comes, the fact that pain has to be endured, the fact that the, all these are values. Read Shakespeare. These are all values on which traditionally our civilization has been founded. I'm actually. Oh, I'm, David, David, can, can, contradiction. Can, Let me David, finish, David. David, because, David because please, here you are. Can I just? Can I finish one sentence? And I wish to say nothing else on this program. I am rather I'm really pleased good. that this old world is dying. Thank you. Jan uh, Janet well, Daly. Cook and I are going to race some, each other yeah. to the to Well, the, you uh, first, Janet. Something right. tells me you're not wholly uh, the, in accord. Yes, the, um, <laughs> the whole notion of Christian morality, and David Cook, the, being the expert, can correct me on this, but I understood the whole point of Christian morality was that you did have to make a choice and that it was a matter of free will. And that if you didn't, if you, if you didn't... Yeah, yes, 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 but it was so a matter of free will. Now, hang on, you said you weren't going to say anything else on this yes. program, David. The, the point was that you made uh, the commitment to faith and the commitment to accept the commandments out of free will. And if you didn't, then there was no virtue in it. Um, it so the idea of choice is absolutely essential to Christian morality. Indeed, David, David Cook. Earlier in the program went back to that garden story and that picture of Adam and Eve confronted with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they chose to eat. And there was human choice from the very foundation of and, the world. And David Cook, do you see our technological opportunities as, as some sort of modern day tree of good and evil? Well, I think that always uh, we, we live in a world where there is a mixture of good and evil and so we need to cling to what's good and to avoid what's evil. And that's why we do need to get beyond the science, beyond the technology to a framework and what's been fascinating in all of the speakers is that none of them have held back from saying we have to have an absolute morality. Yes, it, uh, it was interesting uh, in Hargreaves, wasn't it, that when Janet uh, put it to Lord Winston, I think, that technology uh, might put at risk what we regard as human, was I think the way Janet, uh, as usual, articulately put it. Uh, he, he agreed. Did you agree as well? Uh, or do you uh, think that was going too far? No, I don't, I don't think that that is going too far. I thought it was, um, I mean, in a sense, the most most um, contentious thing that was said this evening was Brian Appleyard's um, suggestion that there's a significant view out there that says that technology can actually form our morality. Uh, I don't think that that's possible. He doesn't wish it to happen, nor do I wish it to happen. I think that what can happen and what uh, may well happen is that the engines of business, the engines of the marketplace may overwhelm uh, our, our ability morally to contain what happens. We've seen seen it happen with nuclear technology, we've seen it happen in the environment, and we could see it happen in genetics. But uh, are you saying uh, it's also we're being deluged with uh, effectively consumer choices in this area that we're unable to handle? No, I think that I, I, my own belief is that the moral instincts and absolutes are sufficiently robust that human beings as individuals can work through that. But they can only work through it if they are given reasonable circumstances in which to make the choices. If they're not given choices because the state is too powerful or because the market is too powerful, individual choice can be made non-viable, and that is the foundation of immorality. Janet Daly. Uh, the market is the systematizing of choice. It's the, it's, it presents you with more choices, and therefore it becomes a bit more complicated. But the only thing that's changed is the frame of reference. I mean, we used to have, as I was saying, our sort of rural frame of reference, which now nostalgically seems terribly natural, but at the time uh, was just as befuddling, just as bewildering as our technological choices now. The, 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 the moral context may change, but the moral principles don't have to. David Cook, David looking very off. pensive. That's right. The principles are universal, and what's fascinating is that the principles of kindness, of respect, of love and compassion are there. They have to be there, and that's the basis on which we can cope with whatever technology show brings us, because ultimately those values are dynamic. They're not static. <laughs> Oh, the voice of hope at the end of the programme. That's it for this week. Uh, from our panel, Janet Daly, Ian Hargreaves, David Starkey, David Cook, and from me. Incidentally, I caught on Sky Television as we came along that if you want a millennium baby, uh, tonight, as they eloquently put it, is the night. I leave you with that thought as we look forward to a technological future. See you next week. Bye-bye. The Moral Maze was presented by Michael Burke and produced by David Coombs.